Can you believe what the price of groceries are now? I mean, my wife came in last week and she had, or two weeks ago, she had three little bags of groceries and she goes, this cost $85. And there wasn't a chunk of meat in the whole batch. It was mostly uh, cereal bars and peanut butter and stuff like that. And the price of gasoline. I get so tired of going to the, the pump and seeing the price keep going up and up and up. I mean, they say it's going to six dollars a gallon. I put gas in my car last week, cost seventy-five dollars. I've talked to some men that have these work trucks that cost one hundred and fifty dollars to put the gas in the truck. Don't you hate that? My spectrum bill last week it increased. Last month went up almost twenty bucks. I took the thing in yesterday. I just I just closed it out. I said I'm done with you. Oh really, sir? Can we give you a little something extra? I said no. You had your chance. I'm done with you. And then what about the sending of billions of dollars to Ukraine when we need that money here in America? I, I'm I'm tired of the government just throwing our money away. And then. What about our borders with all the illegals coming across the borders? Are you being encouraged? Are you being encouraged? No, you're not being encouraged because I am complaining. And you know, sometimes, many times, in our daily lives, this is the way we talk to one another. We share our complaints about how life is treating us. And my premise today is that's not the how the believer should talk. That's not how the believer should think. And he sure shouldn't be spreading that like butter across everybody's bread. I'm speaking to you today on a subject called a heart of contentment. A heart of contentment. And in this world that we live in that is increasingly being frustrating, we see the enemy rising up. The, the many-headed dragon is just kind of showing its teeth now and snarling and doing all sorts of things to make life miserable for us. How can we live with a heart of contentment in this world? I want to ask you to stand to your feet. Right now. <laughs> and we're going to declare two passages of Scripture. I have three to read or share. And I want you to declare them with me. And I want you to say them like you mean it. I want you to declare it like a believer in Christ. I want you to say it out loud with energy. The first passage is Psalm 131. And uh, it's only three verses, so let's read these together. Shall we begin? Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel! Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Amen. And then I want you to read with me, declare Psalm 23. It's six verses. And let's read this one together. Say it before the Lord as you believe it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Be seated. And continue to look to the screen or your Bible, because I want to read a passage out of Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Jesus is preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about the worrisomeness of life. And he says to the people, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to them than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What shall we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I'm going to move my podium just a little bit here. Believers or to have a heart of contentment, not unrest, not worry, and not trouble. They are to live in contentment and peace. And I believe there's a way to do that for every one of us. But the main verse for today is is, uh, back in verse 2 of Psalm 131, the very uh, first one we read. It reads again, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a winged child with his mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. Let's pray. Father, I ask you now to open this word in our understanding, not just to understand it, but to have a revelation of it, that you embed it, uh, engraft it into our hearts today, and that it would bear fruit for your glory, for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. It's an interesting metaphor that the psalmist used uh, in Psalm 131. He's chosen to talk about a weaned child to let us see what contentment and peace is about. And the context of this Psalm 131 is this. It's written by David before he was king. We're not sure what age he was, but he had been anointed by Samuel at the age of 15 to be the king of Israel. But it was another 15 years uh, before he would become king of Israel. And he was anointed in his father's house by this prophet and promised the throne of, God, uh, of Israel. However, as God would direct, David became a friend and servant in the house of Saul, who was the king of Israel at the time. You may remember the story. Uh, David is a young lad. His father sends him to the battlefront to take food to his brothers. And there he encounters Goliath, who is threatening the Israel army. And no one's brave enough to go out and fight the giant. David runs out, takes him down with his slingshot, cuts his head off. And they march through the city with David hanging that head by the hair and and, and the people are singing, Saul's slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. And this got the king's attention. He brings Saul, uh, David to the, uh, to the palace, and he develops a friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. They, they become best friends, and before long, David is sliding his feet under Saul's table. He's enjoying the delicacies of the king, Uh, playing his harp for the king. And one night at dinner, uh, because 
Saul was getting jealous of David's notoriety and his fame. He decides, maybe this young man is out to get my throne. And uh, he throws a javelin at him. And David, quick reflexes, keeps it from hitting him. And it sticks in the wall behind him. And from that point on, David is in fear of his life. And his good friend Jonathan comes to him and says, You need to get out of Dodge. Uh, my dad's after you. He's going to take you out. And so he's chased all across the countryside with Saul's soldiers who've been told to take David's life. And King Saul's jealousy and envy toward David uh, caused David to, to be in frustration, anxiety, fear. If you've ever been on the receiving end of someone's plotting your demise, you could imagine the disturbing agitation that was trying to root itself in David's spirit. The fact that David was not yet king and still a young man explains why he writes verse 1 as he does. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. David is stating that he's not lusting after his kingship, the kingdom, nor is he craving the power that goes with the throne. He is not daydreaming about a time when he'll sit on the throne and rule so that men will revere him, honor him, bow down to him, and serve him. He's wise enough to know that he must walk in an humble attitude. Let God do his work and be open to God's timetable. His eyes weren't lifted up in pride. He wasn't uh, puffed up thinking he was all that in a bag of chips. And he knew that he had a lot of learning to do as it came to governing Matters of state, leading the millions of people who were the citizens of Israel. He was wise enough also to know that he was yet to be taught by the Lord as to how to govern this kingdom. And instead of clamoring and scheming for power and prestige, instead of forcing things to work out according to his own thinking, David declares in his spirit, in his soul, and even in his mind, I'm to be quiet as a weaned child sitting by his mother. So now that we have the context of this psalm and the reason for its existence, let's explore verse 2 for the few minutes here. Hopefully now we have a better understanding as to why David is saying he's sitting by his mother, or he's like a weaned child sitting by its mother. There's a number of references in Scripture that talk about a child weaned from its mother. In Hebrew culture, uh, this process was important and involved all of the family. So important that they would celebrate the completion of it. Today's parents uh, celebrate a lot of milestones in their children's lives. Mommies and daddies don't throw parties at all of them, but uh, each is important in a child's development. Potty training, yay the day, when the children don't have to need diapers anymore. Uh, graduating from a tricycle to a bicycle with the training wheels, and then yet to a bicycle without the training wheels, that's a pretty big day. Uh, going to preschool, going to kindergarten. My grandson Silas graduated from kindergarten Thursday night. He's a big first grader now. And then Nathan graduated from uh, fifth grade into sixth grade. He's now in middle school. And Benjamin is about to graduate to go to high school. So you have all these graduations. You have salvation and baptism day. And wow, they ought to throw a party right there. That deserves one when your children come to Christ. Uh, get their driver's license. That's a big one. But the significance of winning a child in the Hebrew culture was a big deal. I want to refer you to Genesis 21.8. Let's look at that. It's the time when Abraham and Sarah have had Isaac. He's grown some now. And it says, the child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. Now, we know that a child is not weaned in a single day. They're weaned over time. My granddaughter in Oklahoma is going through that right now. Uh, we have watched her take her first bites of rice cereal and some baby food that they make for her. 
She's learning to eat these things, and mom and dad are making a concerted effort to move her from milk to solid food. It's a process that takes time and attention and care to accomplish. So, on this day, I believe Abraham is just announcing, my son has been weaned. And he's saying he's no longer dependent on his mother as a baby would be, and it's a cause for celebration. Now I want to read you some things I found as I researched this, so bear with me as I just quote it to you, but it's, it it's, will help us understand what God wants us to be like in this thing of being a weaned child. According to Jewish custom, the time when a child is weaned is cause for celebration. A weaned child has survived the fragile stage of infancy and now can eat solid food. He's or she has survived the fragile state of infancy. Do you know a new Christian is in a fragile state? A lot of people can walk away from God when the trials and the tests come because they think maybe everything's going to be rosy. Remember the story of Jesus when he uh, told about the casting of the seed on the different soils. And in one of the soils, it had thorns and briars grow up in it. And it choked out the, choked out the plants. And then another one fell on ground that had been scuffed up, but it wasn't deep enough for the seedling to take root. And the hot sun comes out and it burns it up. This is what happens sometimes with new Christians. They, they're, they're needing the milk of the Word. They're needing the milk of God's Spirit, our, our love. But they didn't, they didn't get to their time of weaning. They didn't stay with it long enough. And the enemy has come in and stolen what they were really looking for. So, according to Jewish, and I continue to read, according to Jewish rabbinical traditions, weaning could take place anywhere between 18 months and 5 years of age. In one important biblical parallel, Samuel was weaned prior to being taken to Eli, the priest, to serve the Lord. You remember the story of Hannah. And she's Barren, she prays to God, will you give me a child? If you would, give me a son, I'll give him back to you. So at some point, that happens, a miracle happens. She, she uh, cares for the child as it's an infant and into its maybe toddler days. And she weans the child and she fulfills her promise. And we pick it up at 1 Samuel 1.24. And when she had weaned him, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. It doesn't give us an exact age, but the weaning is mentioned. And Samuel's youth is emphasized, so he was likely between two and four years old. I continue to read one more paragraph. High infant mortality rates existed in ancient cultures. One reason for large families was the fact that many young children did not live to adulthood. Because of the risk that infants faced, the celebration of a child's weaning was a natural and important part of the culture. If a child had developed past the need for the physical support of a mother, then he or she had reached a new stage of life that greatly increased the likelihood of good health. I want to ask you today, and it's still early in the message, are you a weaned child? Have you come to a point, your stage in life, where you are a healthy Christian? Are you walking, eating the meat of God's Word, fellowshipping with Him? Are you at a place where, come what may, the old expression, hell or high water, you're staying with God. Nothing can take you off of that. Are you... A weaned child. Now let's contrast this weaned child with a child that's still feeding on the breast or the bottle. A hungry baby cries and it fusses when it's finally on the breast of the bottle. It, it sucks hard and it sucks fast. That baby is the center of its own universe. Watching my granddaughter nurse a bottle back in March when we were visiting... Let me see just how a baby acts when it feels famished. It's growing so quickly. 
And mommy's milk, a formula, doesn't last that long. It's, it's hungry every two hours. And it doesn't care how much noise it makes or who it might disturb. It wants to be fed and it wants it now. But the weaned child is taking solid food. And there's no longer the need of the bottle or the milk. The solid sustenance lasts much longer and is more satisfying. Vegetables and fruits and protein and carbohydrates do their work and keep the weaned child comfortable, fuller, and at rest longer. The weaned child isn't starving and clamoring for the milk because she's satisfied on something better. And depending on how old the child is, we could actually say she is not only not clamoring for the milk, she's satisfied with the meat. The writer of Hebrews says that he wanted to feed them, he wanted to teach them the meat of the Word, but they could still only handle the baby food. He couldn't teach them the deeper things of God because they were still spiritual infants. They were still drinking milk when they should have been eating meat. So in the context of this passage, we see David taking an humble posture. He is exercising submission, meekness, capitulation to the purposes and the timing of God. And he's not demanding his own way. He's not throwing a tantrum. He's not the center of the universe. He's not demanding that God give him his due. Now, he was promised the throne, right? But David has made the decision not to be disturbed in his own soul. and his own mind over what could be seen as God's delay of the promise. He might have had course through his mind. Maybe Samuel got it wrong. Maybe he did anoint the wrong guy. Maybe I'm not the one. David chooses not to whine or complain or grumble about this circumstance. He establishes within himself a strategy to keep his head on straight about the whole matter. He chooses to be as calm as the weaned child sitting by its mother's side, content with this cir circumstance, content with a faithful promise and content with the God who made that promise. Notice this opening phrase of verse 2. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul. What does that statement imply? What does it say without overtly saying it? Well, I think in, it says in order to calm something, what goes before? A storm? A disturbance? Chaos, anxiety, fear. Disquiet has been pounding on the door of his mind. Agitation and angst and trepidation. A foreboding that this is not going to work out. Saul's going to capture me, take me out. We don't have the knowledge of just what was happening as David penned these words. But we might imagine him off to a quiet place. Pastor Joel used to say, let's use our sanctified imagination. <laughs> I want you to do that with me here a minute. We might see David getting alone with God. Maybe his men are over by a campfire. And, and, and this storm is brewing in his head. His heart is full of fear. And he goes over to a quiet place. He falls on his knees to worship the Lord. And we can hear him begin to defend himself before the Lord. He says, Father... My heart has not been proud in this thing. You know that. I haven't lifted up my eyes in any lofty way. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, says, oh, I just get the goosebumps when I think about this, that David rejoiced in his own integrity. Boy, that's huge. It was part of his ability to get calm. David rejoiced in his own integrity. My friend, pray over that. Can you come before God and say, God, you know I haven't been this and I have It's not the publican beating his chest saying, oh, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. That's not what that's about. It's a 
an honest assessment of, I haven't sinned and I don't understand why I'm dealing with this. And I'm telling you, in my own family, we have gone through things that we go, what did we do wrong, Father? What did we do wrong to get this outcome right here? That's never good. It would be so much stronger if we could say, I know I haven't been walking in sin. I know I have been doing my best to live in your righteousness, live in your holiness, be under the blood, love you with all my heart, and I can rejoice in my own integrity. That gives you strength to come to the Lord. He was conscious of the fact that he had walked uprightly before God and before King Saul. David did not begin this journey on his own. God initiated it by sending Samuel to his doorstep. David had not connived a plan to dethrone Saul. He had not gathered men about him to overthrow Saul's throne like Solomon did with him later, many years later when he was the king. Solomon set up a coup and pushed David out of the throne, out of the kingdom. David walked barefoot out of Jerusalem. He had not done that with Saul. Let's go ahead and imagine more of what he might be saying. David could have said, I haven't looked upon Saul or the throne of Israel with a haughty look or a heart of pride, thinking that somehow I could lead this nation better than he can. God, I haven't attempted to walk in Saul's shoes, reasoning out his decisions, finding fault with him. That's all above my pay grade. I haven't pretended or assumed that I know more than I really do. I've not been restless, nor have I laid plans for when the throne is mine. I've not vaulted myself uh, uh, before others in word or deed. You know that my heart has been pure this entire time. I think David is saying here that he could have been content to live life as he started it. He was a, sh he was a shepherd boy. And he could have continued to live just like that. He loved God then. He had a relationship with God then. And he could have continued that. He didn't ask for this. And he's reminding the Lord that he didn't take part in getting this going. He had not aspired to be a politician. He had no aspirations to be a military war hero. All of these things came to him. And he knew in his own heart that he was pure in his motivations before God. He rejoiced in his own integrity. Can we do that? What confidence that can give us as we make our request known to God. Let's continue to use our sanctified imaginations to explore David's prayer. He might have said, yes, yet I'm struggling with some fear here, Father. I'm struggling with the worry that Saul and his army could come in upon us at any time. I'm not only hiding for my life out here, but I'm endangering these men's lives as well. But I've decided that confusion... And the craziness and the chaos that Saul is trying to bring to me, I'm not going to get caught up in that. You have people in your life sometimes who are trying to bring their craziness to you. Their chaos into your life. You say, I'm not getting caught up in that. I will try to help you as much as I can, but I'm not getting pulled down into your dark place. And sometimes we have to just Hold the line in those areas. My hope is in you, Father. I declare that my soul is at peace. My soul is bathed in God's shalom. I choose to be like a winged child sitting at its mother's side. I trust you, Lord, to take care of me. I will not clamor. I will not give in to fear, nor allow the disturbance and strife of life rule over me. You are my rock and salvation. Whom shall I fear? What can Saul really do to me? And then he says, Lord, I wish all of Israel could hope in the Lord as I have today. 
This statement to me is proof of David's kingly heart. He moves from thinking of his own needs to praying for all of Israel. His newfound confidence fills him up, puts a faith-filled backbone in his body, and David wants to share it with all the nation of Israel. One well-respected theologian believes this portion of the psalm could mean that David is praying that the nation not rise up and put him on the throne prematurely. David's taking the throne must be in God's time. He desired that the people not thwart God's wise plan. A coup would smear and stain his rule forever. He knew God's timing would establish his throne so that all may honor him as God's choice of king. Another old dead guy, theologian, says about this passage, and I've got it on the screen, David's soul is weaned from all discouragement, ambitiousness, and self-seeking, or any kind of selfishness, waiting on the Lord, finding rest and contentment only in Him. Another writer, David Berry, writes this, instead of striving to understand things that are Outside his understanding, the psalmist continues to trust Yahweh. He lets the matters that have troubled him remain mysterious and unresolved. Sometimes, just leave that up there a second. Sometimes it's best for we humans to let God be God. To live with the mystery. You don't have to know everything, and believe you me, my life, I, I've already seen this happen. Father will let you walk with Him on a need-to-know basis. That's okay. Wise is the Christian who settles this in their mind and heart and embraces living in the mystery. Be comfortable with just saying, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm good with that. David knew of his anointing to be king, that was for sure. But why Saul was trying to take him out, he really didn't understand that. Why his ascension to the throne was taking years to accomplish, he didn't understand. He could not see into the future, he had no crystal ball. He could not predict what tomorrow would hold. All of us have been there, right? We've been there. You, you, you have to sit in the moment and rest. You cannot think about tomorrow such that it brings you anxiety, certainly not discouragement. What we must have is hope. Hope. What are you facing today that you do not understand? What unknowns are troubling you, pestering you, causing you to doubt or murmur or complain? Perhaps you've been burning a lot of emotional and mental energy trying to figure it out. Do you need to come to the place that David did? Do you need to quiet yourself like a weaned child? Do you need to stop clamoring and fussing about milky questions and pablum answers and feast on the meat? that God wants you to eat? Do you need to stop trying to walk in matters that are too difficult for you? You will never figure some things out, so you can't see the end of it. this thing you're in. God sees it from the beginning to the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He knows exactly. And our trust in Him has got to help us settle our soul and spirit and rest in Him. Now I want to take a few minutes and Go through Psalm 23, verse by verse. I've just got a little bit to say of each one, and it will be finished. I was on the phone with my son Paul this week. Uh, they've had some uh, medical health issues with uh, his wife's father this week. And I just talked to him again this morning, and I guess he forgot that he said it to me earlier in the week, 
he starts quoting Psalm 23. And I said, what you, you mentioned that earlier in the week, that, that, that was where you were finding some strength. He said, oh, Dad, I, I was just praying that like big time this morning. Just, and he said, I found such strength just praying Psalm 23 over this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isn't that a most beautiful line? Isn't that the most beautiful phrase? Have you ever just prayed that one line right there? I found myself at times in that moment of worry and I just pause and just say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Just reminds me again of where my source is. This promise, this verse promises no lack of the essential things of life. Not only does it promise no lack, we know the, the Lord is El Shaddai. We know there's an abundance in God. Verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. This talks about rest and refresh. I remember as a child uh, playing out on a hot summer day and uh, being all sweaty and tired and you go over and lay down in the green grass under a shade tree. You remember those times? Man, that green grass felt so good. It's cool. And you lay there a little while and you get refreshed. You get up and go after it again. The psalmist is, is saying, let the Lord bring you to the place of rest and refreshment. God isn't going to lead us to lay down in the rocks and the cactus and the briars and the sticks. No, He wants you to lay down in the green grass. Still waters represent the refreshing of His Spirit. He wants to rejuvenate us and supply the essential strength and hydration of his spirit. I remember mowing the yard with my dad when I was oh, nine, ten, right in there, nine and ten. <clears throat> and it was a push mower. We didn't have a riding mower. We had a big yard where we lived at the time. And <clears throat> he'd give me the mower, and I'd make a squiggly line down through there and come back, and I couldn't push it straight. He'd, he'd take it for a few minutes, and it was all squared up. And then I'd push it and it'd be all squiggly again. At some point he would say, let's take a break. He'd go in the house and he, he never put the water in a typical jar. He, he would get a saucepan. It was the funniest thing. Get a saucepan and put some ice in it and put water in there. And he'd bring it out and he'd pour it in a cup for us. But it was always in a saucepan. I never figured that out. Why would do that? We would sit there under the shade tree on the ground. Drink that water. Man, just being with your father is one thing to, do, you know, working hard in this hot sun and getting to be refreshed right there with him. That was the best thing. And then one day he said, okay, I'm not mowing the yard with you anymore. It's all yours. <laughs> oh, really? No, this was going so good. <laughs> And then I, I, I didn't know how to stop and be refreshed. I would, just, I would just go at it until I finished. It's good to take a break from life's troubles. Get away with God. Get under the shade tree. Drink some of the refreshing of the Spirit. Let Him, let him uh, love on you and refresh you. I think the first part of verse 3, He restoreth my soul should go with verse 2. But it says, He restoreth my soul, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. The path of God's righteousness is not hard to find. <laughs> it's not. Not hard to see. If you've ever been on a hike in the woods and you've lost the trail, you know how worrisome that can be. Suddenly you feel lost. may not be, but you feel lost and concerned that you might not find your way back so easily. When our sons were younger, we did a lot of hiking in the Red River Gorge. Lovely place to go. 
<clears throat> we've probably been on most every trail. What we would find is that these trails were well-worn paths, dutifully marked and labeled, even for the novice hiker. We've gotten off the trail before and went a ways, and somebody says, I don't, I don't think we're on the trail. I mean, it kind of looks like a trail, but it's not the trail. So we'd have to backtrack and pick it up. Two things have to happen to keep the paths easy to follow, at least in the park as I was thinking about it. Number one, the park staff who work there annually clear back the undergrowth from the forest path. They go through and they, they cut that back so you can see it. But secondly, well, let me say, we've been on trails that have needed some tending. Early in the spring, go out there and there's poison ivy growing out over it. There's briars, there's sticks, there's little sapling trees that took root and come up. Uh, and we've said, you know, the, the park staff hasn't been through here. Or number two, people haven't been through here. Number two is, previous hikers also helped pick, keep the path worn down. Those who have gone down the trail before you have walked down the weeds and the little trees and stuff that might attempt to take root in the middle of the trail. So should the park staff cease to do their job, or other hikers quit using that trail, then it would become overgrown and eventually hard to find. But folks, teachers and pastors, life group leaders, these are like the park staff. Coming to church is helping Get your mind in, on the path, stay on the path, and then see it clearly because of the teaching of the Word, and the fellowship of the Word. But we also have one another. And those are, each of us are going down that same path. Some have gone before us. And they've worn it down so you can see the path. It's not hard to find. Generations of Christ followers, be it your family members or friends or fellow church members, both past and present, are walking that path to set an example for you to follow. Go where they have gone. Walk where those who have gone before you have been and do your part to keep the path clear for those who come behind you. When I'm in this house and I'm in worship, my eyes are not always on that screen singing those words. Sometimes they're closed. Sometimes they're open. Sometimes I just want to take in the crowd and watch us worship together. And it's difficult. It's difficult. It's hard for me to be encouraged when I see believers not worshiping. When, the, when that word is not coming out of your mouth. Now you say, well, I can't sing. Yes, you can. You can. Mouth the words, just say the words, just speak them. But we encourage one another when we worship. And we're showing each other the path. You're saying, come and go with me. This God's great. My God is great. I'm in love with Him. Come and love the God I love. But if we're sitting silent, we're clammed up, we don't enter into the worship, we don't pray, You're letting the path get overgrown. You're not doing your part. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Sometimes these well-worn paths of righteousness will take you through low places. Even through valleys. But even in the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear. We've all seen horror movies, probably. I've, I signed off on those my first year we were married. We watched a movie on Halloween night together. We didn't have any children. We watched it. Uh, something on Elm Street. I don't remember what the title was. But after it was over, we looked at each other and I said, we're not ever going to watch horror movies again. I mean, that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big boy, but I don't like that. That puts something in my spirit I don't like. But we've all been seeing movies where the trees are kind of growing out and the moon's coming through there and the 
Shadows are being cast. When God leads you, He might take you down some valleys where those shadows are being cast on you. Might take you to places where God challenges you to take a leap of faith. Jump off. But what you see before you is just a shadow of death, maybe. Not all of it's going to be that way. Sometimes the sun is shining brightly and the flowers are coming up out of the ground and it's beautiful. But sometimes you go through dark places and you can't see the end of it. Will you continue to walk the path or will you shy back? Will you run back the other way? Will you be content in God as a winged child even if the path of righteousness takes you through a valley? It may look like God is wanting you to risk something. If I do this, I might lose. Uh, I'm going to struggle. Uh, will I die if I go the way God said go? But remember, it's just a shadow. It's not the real thing. What do you have to have to cast a shadow? What's the big thing on the other side? A light. A light. God is the light guiding you through. He's shining down through those things that may be a struggle. Keep walking. Don't let the shadow intimidate you. Verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. When I read this, these verses, I, I imagine myself sitting at a banquet table. And it is a beautiful banquet table. It has got so much food on it. Big glazed turkey and the hams and vegetables. It's desserts. It's full. And I'm sitting in a, like a big banquet hall. And not many feet away are my enemies. The ghouls and the goblins that have previously or may yet want to destroy me and take me down. But here's the cool thing. They're behind bars. They're behind big steel bars. And they're reaching through and they're growling and they're trying to get at me. But they can't. And I'm sitting over there at the table and I just laugh. I just laugh and take another bite off that turkey leg. I am eating in the presence of my enemies. They can do no harm to me. My feet are under the king's table. And they, I can be calm. I can be easy about it. Now his anointing my head with oil, that didn't relate to me too well. Back in the day it might have been hairspray, but I don't even do that anymore. But in David's time that was a big deal. But I still see myself sitting there in the finest of clothes. I'm well groomed. I'm a rich man. I'm a rich man. And it's, it's just a perfect place for me. I go to pick up a goblet full of some fine drink and the cup is so full it spills over the side as I raise it to my lips to drink the nectar of that cup. My contentment level is high and Father God has met my needs to abundance. In the last verse, Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 2 of Psalm 131 said, Surely I have calmed. Both of these verses start with the same word, surely. It means the truth of the matter is this. The fact of the matter is this. It's true in every situation. It's altogether true. And it's very similar to times when Jesus would have said, Verily, verily, I say unto you. It denotes a truth that is so profound that no circumstance can ever change it. We might say, Altogether and in every circumstance and situations, I have two companions that walk with me throughout my life. Mr. Goodness and Mr. Mercy. And they follow me 
all the days of my life. And the truth, the fact of the matter is, in every situation altogether, I have calmed and I've quieted my soul like a winged child by its mother because those two guys are walking by my side. What more could you ask for? Are you living your life with a heart of contentment? All that comes with a relationship with the Godhead, the Father, the loving Father, the King Jesus, and the comforting friendship of the Holy Spirit, is that enough for us? Which of these two illustrations describes you? I created these. I don't know how good they are, but you'll see on the first one, the burdens of life, the incomprehensible stuff that invades your daily journey. Some of it just comes by living in this world. Some of it is self-inflicted. Sometimes we go after vain things and make mistakes and, and yet and sin. These things show up in your life bigger than Father God. In fact, the illustration shows that God is not actually completely in your life. He's kind of half hanging in, half hanging out. The stuff that bombards you and tries to weigh you down is looming and consuming and grooming you for daily defeat. Look at number two. Now, in this one, Father God is the consuming part of my life. He's the big, big God who has it all in control. And the stuff that was so looming in the other diagram appears so small and insignificant compared to the place that God has. I bet you most of you can't even read those, those yellow words on the, on the brown uh, or the black circle. Can't even read them because they're so insignificant. This stuff is actually swallowed up by Father God and you can rest like a weaned child by its mother. Let's look at it another way. I had another idea. Where's your focus? Where's your focus? Is it looking at the stuff of life? God's there. God's there. He just... You know... I just thought of this. When I'm taking driver's ed, and we do that night uh, instruction, the instructor says, don't look right out there in the headlights. Don't look short. Look out at the end of them. Because if you're looking right here at the end of your hood, something will come up out there in the dark, and you, you missed it. It's too late. So where's our focus? Are we looking, are we looking short? And looking at stuff that is dragging us down, the next one shows us in a much better focus. Father God is our focus. And the other, can't even see it. I can't recognize it. It's not, it's not an issue for me. So to wrap up, we will not be as a weaned child trusting in a faithful God if our focus is on the stuff of the world. I wish I had another term for that. Jesus called it mammon. A lot of times we think mammon is money, and I guess in the context Jesus was speaking of, it is money. It takes money to live. But mammon can be just the stuff of the world. I saw some people yesterday on social media, these two people and their robots doing to music. And I'm thinking, how many hours did that couple invest to learn how to do that to music? What are, you, what are they spending their life on? And that's just going to be a trend. That's going to fly away someday. Nobody will care whether you can do a robot or not. Get our eyes off of this stuff. Jesus said we cannot serve two masters. We will hate one and love the other. And if too much of the world and the world system is still in our view, 
if burdens and trials, unsanctified ambitions. I had a, before I came to Living Waters, I was at Graceland Baptist Church in New Albany, and I was the second guy, Minister of Music, uh, worked for him. We would have a meeting on Monday, and so we'd have our meeting and plan the week out, we have a prayer, and I was walking out the door, and just, Every time I was walking out that door, he said, uh, Philip, yeah? He said, sanctify your ambitions. And I'm going, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So after about the fifth or sixth time, I said, Joel, this guy's name is Joel Reagan. I said, Joel, uh, do you feel like my ambitions are unsanctified? And he goes, no, it's just a little thing I live by. A guy told me that years ago, and I just... I think about it every day, and I just thought I'd stick it in your head. He stuck it in my head, and it's been there ever since. But it's a good rule to live by, because I've had some ambitions that weren't sanctified. They weren't given to God. And we want to have ambitions that are His, His gift to us. Otherwise, we're just, we're just doing like the robot people. We're just uh, wasting our time. So, unsanctified ambitions and strife, is that where our hearts are? If, if, if it is, we really will have no strength to quiet ourselves in Him. We will be so caught up in the fretting and the clamoring and the striving and the worrisomeness that the world is constantly in. The unbeliever is there, but the believer, no, not there. The shalom of God will evade us and we will live our lives most miserably. Matthew Henry says, and I have this quote up, Our hearts are desirous of worldly things. We cry for them, we're fond of them, but by the grace of God, a soul that is made holy is weaned from these things. The child is cross and fretful while in the weaning, but in a day or two, cares no longer for that milk, it can bear stronger food. Thus does disappointments in what it hoped for. And just, uh, no, and thus does a converted soul quiet itself under the loss of what it loved and disappointments in what it hoped for. And it's easy, whatever happens. Then he says, when our condition is not to our mind, we must bring our mind to our condition. Then we are easy to ourselves and all about us then our souls are as a weaned child. If I'm speaking in, to anyone today in this room or online, today or another day, that's the beauty of having the online presence. Others can watch it at another time. If I'm speaking to you, you may find that the weaning you need to do is off of worldly stuff and off of your worry. And, and, and to try to get off of that, that might bring a little pain to you. That might be very frustrating. But you can do it with God's help. I want to talk a little bit about that, that last thing there. He says, uh, when our condition is not to our mind, we must bring our mind to our condition. When we come to realize that the restless, wearisome, unhappy, joyless state that we are living in is not the condition of the believer, and it's not the quality of life God expects us to live in, when we wake up, we realize what the Apostle Peter calls the hidden inner man of the heart has been uh, overtaken by trouble and doubt, fear, and worry. Do I have that scripture up there, that uh, 1 Peter 3, 4? There it is. Peter admonishes that this hidden inner man should be characterized, and, and in the context of this, Scripture. He's talking about women uh, wearing apparel that makes them look uh, uh, important and flashy and whatnot. But I, I don't think we do harm to the context or to the Scripture. It's a little different context I'm using it. But he says, this hidden inner man, this hidden inner person, if you walk in peace, the gentle and quiet spirit, that's beautiful. It's incorruptible. And it's precious in the sight of God. It's precious in the sight of God. It's pleasing to Him. 
He wants you to, to live like this. And we bring our mind to our condition. We make some serious decisions and changes in order to bring the shalom of God to our hidden inner man. The chief decision being that we choose to really live by faith and not by sight. How do we do this? Here's the way I do it. You do it. You pray and ask God. But I ask God, I said, I want you to wake me up. Uh, smoke me in the side. Hit me. Slap me. Talk to me. Shout at me. Every time I come to some troubling thought, some anxious thought, every time I speak a doubtful word as to God's faithfulness. If you have a conversation with someone, let's say you're, you're talking about those soaring gas prices, it would be better for you to stop mid-sentence. You know, this gas is so high. Uh, okay, the Lord just spoke to me there, and He's telling me that that's a doubtful word. And so I'm going to stop right there. And the Lord is my strength and my song, and He's going to take care of me. And He is the, my shepherd, I shall not want. And I know God is going to supply my needs according to His riches and glory. Christ Jesus. You did that to a loved one, family, friend, me. If you're complaining to me, just stop. And say, you know what, the Lord just spoke to me about that. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop speaking right there because I'm speaking doubt. I'm speaking fear. And uh, what a witness you would be if you just, just did that. Ask the Lord to wake you up and cause you to quit doing that. I want to close by us. We started out speaking the word together. I want to do that again. Would you stand to your feet, please? We're going to sing a song here in a second. But I want to close by using Philippians 4, 6 through 7. I was afraid Pastor Stephen was going to get in. He was in Philippians 4 earlier. I said, oh, is he going to get my verse? Great. Okay. I really wanted to encourage you today, but I knew the way it might come out. You know, it's, it's okay to be convicted. It's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to wail and, and, and cry to repent. Just say, Lord, I, I see that I do this. I, I'm not sitting as a weaned child by its mother. I'm, I'm, I'm clamoring. I'm worried. I'm fretting. That's how the unbeliever walks. I'm not going to walk like that. I'm going to walk in faith. All right, I want you to declare these words with me. I think it's two screens, so here we go. Let's do it. Be anxious for nothing. Let's do it again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you join me and just praise the Lord for His, His promise to us. Oh, we thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Help us to all be as, as a weaned child sitting by its mother, content and at rest. Lord, you are our Father. And there's no one like you. And so uh, we just give ourselves to you once again. Refine us. Take us into the sanctified places of holiness we need to be living in. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Let's sing a little bit and I'm going to come back and we'll close. And so let's just worship together for these few moments we have left. No, really. 
reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Your son for redemption, the price for my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. No, I don't understand. I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. And I run to the Father. No reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again. Oh, I'll run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait, my heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. talk to the those of you are online right now there's a, 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 a phone number should be on your screen we're going to try to put it up right now if you'll call that number someone that is able and capable and will love you would, would talk with you right now if you need to know Christ as your personal Savior we just like for you to call that number and that person will lead you in a way to be introduced to Jesus and you can make him Lord of your life uh, we should have some altar ministry people up here if they would come now and be prepared to pray with folks. Uh, if you're in the room here today and you don't know Jesus or you faltered in your trust and your faith and you'd like to just, uh, what was that one of those earlier songs said we were reintroduced to His love? Uh, maybe you need to be reintroduced to Christ and, 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 and kind of reclaim where you have walked with Him. So we'd like for our altar ministry people to come. And uh, we're just going to continue to sing. Lord, I just pray that you would bless us as we go. Bless our week. Help us to be the church this week. As we step out into a world that needs you. A world that's dark and undone. A world that's going wayward by the day. Uh, and we're not surprised you said it would do that. But people need Jesus. And we pray that we'll be a, a testimony. Uh, a life lived before them. Words that we say. Uh, prayers that we'll pray for them. Uh, experiences that we'll have with our co-workers and our family and our friends and our neighbors. We just pray that we would be a light into a dark world. Bless us now as we go. Keep us in your health and in your strength and in your love because of Jesus Christ and all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Let all God's people say amen. Amen. You can be dismissed. You can stay and sing. Thank you, praise team, for leading us once again. God bless you. My heart has been Long before my first breath, running into your arms is running to life from death. My heart has been in your sight. Long before my It's running to life from death And I, I feel, feel this rush deep in my chest Your mercy is calling out And just as I am, you pull me in And I know I need you now I run to the Father, I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, 
my shoulder to friend Though I run to the Father again and again Though I run to the Father I call him to grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart found a certain And my soul found a 